always forward, never back. You ever heard something like that before? Always forward, never back. Uh, or if you know um, this, this, uh, the, the character from the novels, uh, the Jack Reacher novels, Jack Reacher, he, it, it, he sometimes says, never go back. He, he has this view of, of, of never turn back, go, whatever you've done back there, just, just leave it and walk to the next town. <laughs> Always forward, never back. Uh, that phrase actually comes from a, a series that, that my wife and I have been watching. Uh, it's called The Imposters. Some of you might have seen it. Um, it's fairly new, I think. Uh, and in The, the Imposters, there is this lead character called Maddie. And Maddie is a con artist. Uh, and what she does is, is rather smart. She takes advantage of men who are a bit silly, right? <laughs> well, just takes advantage of men. I know we all have our issues, right? What she does is she gets into relationship with men, and in fact with women as well, gets into intimate relationships, uh, ends up marrying these people as quickly as possible, and then as soon after the wedding as possible, she makes sure she has all their banking details, PIN numbers, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, maxes out their credit cards, transfers all their money away, sells their house to some other person, and disappears. And all she does is leaves behind a video saying, listen... <laughs> So I know you're not really happy right now, <laughs> um, but, uh, but you need to move on. <laughs> and and with, these, with these partners that she has, she, she, she's always telling them, the one thing that's in common with all of them is she tells them, always forward, never back. She's constantly sowing into them. The one little bit of good that's in her is constantly sowing into them this idea that they must always move forward and never go back. She's wanting to say to them now, once I've left you, uh, just move forward. Don't look back. Don't worry about what's happened. Move forward. <laughs> What's interesting about it, though, is that that catchphrase, always forward, never back, is probably more appropriate for Maddie. She needs it to be able to cope because her past is too painful. If you think about it, her past is full of people she has betrayed, people who she's allowed to come close to her, allowed to love her, and she can't look back at that because she won't be able to cope thinking about all those people she's taken advantage of. You see, what's strange with Maddie is that her past is actually one of love. She has a whole raft of people who have loved her. She's run away from them, but they, their love for her was genuine. So the series is fascinating because these uh, people that she's abandoned come back and try and find her. And what's fascinating is that they are all, without fail, willing to forgive her. They just want to live life with her again. Lent, this period which we have left behind now, uh, Lent is a time to look back. It's a time when we reflect on, on our brokenness. It's a time when we re reflect on some of those feelings we have of having let God down, of, of separation from God. It's a season where, where we reflect on this idea of forgiveness. And when we get to, get to Good Friday, we get to, to, to remember Jesus on the cross dying for us to show us that, that we don't have to be separated from God, that there is grace, that there is forgiveness. It's an opportunity to reflect on how God has worked in our lives over the years, how he has been there through the hard times, through the pain, through the difficulty, through our successes. It's an opportunity to reflect on the fact that we have never been separated from God, that he has been with us all along. But when we leave this Lent period and, and this, this Easter weekend, then what? Where do we go from there in, in the Christian journey? Our scripture reading this morning uh, comes from Luke's gospel, chapter 24, and I just want to give you a little bit of context to the reading. Uh, the reading tells us that it takes place on the third day, so it's kind of the, the, the Sunday of the, of the whole Easter story. Uh, it's just after the resurrection, but it's before the resurrection has gone public, right? So only Jesus knows he's risen. Other people have heard some rumors, but, but Jesus is the only one who knows. Uh, the story immediately before this passage uh, is, is about the woman at the tomb. 
Uh, they come and they discover the empty tomb and, and they're devastated. They don't know what's happened. Uh, and then they claim, according to the way it's written in Scripture, they claim, allegedly, <laughs> that angels came to see them and told them to not worry that Jesus is risen. And of course, they share this with the men, and the men are like, these women are just being emotional. <laughs> and they don't take them seriously. Peter actually gets called, and he comes, and he sees the empty tomb for himself. But I suspect what was going through his head was, who has stolen Jesus? <laughs> who stole the body? Can they, could they not have, 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 have stopped at this point? They've done so much to us. They've ruined our lives. So that's the context where this story kicks off. Uh, it, it's about... Two other disciples, not part of the original 12, uh, you'll notice that the passage refers to 11 disciples, that's because Judas has, has left the scene by this point, so it talks about the 11, but these particular two disciples were not part of that 11, they were, they were some of the other uh, people who were Christ followers who were around that community. And so we read together from Luke's Gospel chapter 4 starting from verse 13. And if you'd allow me, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to interrupt as we read through this passage, and, I, and I'm going to talk a little bit about what it's saying to us. Now, that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. Okay, so now we're not quite sure where this place Emmaus was exactly, but, but the basic concept is Jerusalem, the place where Jesus was crucified, pain, suffering, don't want to think of that, let me go to Emmaus and let me forget about that. Right? Make sense? They are moving forward. <laughs> they are forgetting. Always forward, never back. What's there is too painful. We need to get away from it all. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked alongside, uh, along with them. But they were kept from recognizing him. The scripture doesn't tell us how that worked, what were the mechanics, what was the science of how they were kept from recognizing him. Perhaps God kind of, you know, put blinkers on their eyes. But perhaps they were blinded by their sense of grief, of hopelessness. The very concept of Jesus being alive was not in their frame of reference. So whoever this man was might have looked a bit like Jesus, but clearly it's not Jesus. Uh, but okay, we'll talk to him. What is it that prevents you from recognizing the risen Christ? What is it that prevents you from recognizing the risen Christ? Is there pain in your life or in your past? Is there grief? Is there hurt? Is it guilt? Is it doubt? So Jesus asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them named Cleopas asked, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that happened there in these days? <laughs> Which is funny because he's the only one who knows <laughs> what happened in those days, for real, <laughs> right? Jesus replies very simply. It's kind of like, okay, I'll play along with these guys. <laughs> what things? What are these things? I'm, I'm, the, I'm the naive person. I don't know anything here. Clearly, you know better than me, so tell me what's been happening. I'm fascinated to hear. They then launch into what is now going to be the next six verses. It's a six-verse expose that would be worthy of a carte blanche special, right? About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet powerful in word and deed. Now, what's funny about the fact that they say he was a prophet is that Jesus was a little more than a prophet, right? <laughs> he was the Savior. He was the Messiah. He was the Christ. But they are, they've already relegated him to just being another one of those prophets who comes, speaks, dies. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed, before God and all the people, the chief priests 
and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. Do you, you see, what's happening here is that, is that the disciples misunderstood Jesus' modus operandi, what he was trying to achieve. They thought he was the guy who was going to become the political leader, that if they backed him, they would potentially have power in the future, and they would be a part of liberating Israel from the, the Roman rule. They thought this was the guy that was going to liberate them as people in, re, in their reality, their day-to-day -day reality. And certainly there was an element of truth in that, but of course Jesus was, 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 was there to teach something far bigger. And Jesus is thinking to himself, I'm sure I told these guys about this. I'm sure I explained that it's not just political motives that I'm here for. And they carry on. And what is more, it is the third day since this all took place, which is actually the author kind of <laughs> using it a bit of license here probably, saying, you know, it's the third day. They're supposed to link it back to what Jesus used to teach them about the fact that he would, that there'd be something, the, 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 the temple would rise up on the third day, right? So they've missed this completely. In addition, some of our women, <laughs> you know those women, please, the way I'm saying this is not my opinion, right? I'm, I'm, I'm speaking for these slightly dim-minded disciples. Uh, in addition, some of our women amazed us. <laughs> they went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. So then in their emotional state, they came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels. <laughs> and guess what? They said, the angel said to them, he's alive. Can you even imagine? Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the woman had said. But they did not see Jesus. Basically, all in all, what these disciples are saying is after all of this, after all we gave to Jesus, after all we invested in, this, in, in, in his mission and, and, and in following him, we got schneid. <laughs> and then they start the blame game. It was the chief priests, the leaders, they crucified him. Maybe in their heads they're thinking, maybe, maybe, maybe Jesus failed. <laughs> He was going to do all this great stuff, but it turns out he wasn't who he said he was. He's dead. He failed. He misled us. Maybe Jesus is conning us, just like Maddie in, in, in the series that I was telling you about. Maybe Jesus led us on this whole path that was all complete nonsense. And now, just to add salt to the wounds, they've stolen the body. Somebody has taken this body away. Jesus then goes on now in response to reveal the scriptures to them. He said to them, how foolish you are and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. See, what Jesus does is, is he reveals the, the, the scriptures, the, it would be what we understand as the Old Testament scriptures to them. He links prophecy to actual events. He helps them to understand the Easter story. You see, for those, those disciples, uh, they needed something of an enlightenment of their memory. They remembered all of these activities, but they hadn't joined the dots. They hadn't seen how it related to the bigger story. They hadn't seen how what Jesus was doing fitted into God's unfolding story. They needed somebody to make sense of it all. Before we go back to our passage, I want to, I want to quickly jump somewhere else, and it won't be on the screen, so, so if you just, just listen. Uh, John, when he writes his gospel, uh, explains this in, 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 in the following way. And the, the context is it's just after, it's basically the Palm Sunday story. So Jesus has come into Jerusalem on a donkey and there's these people waving palm leaves and so on. And John says, at first his disciples did not understand all of this that was going on. Only after Jesus was glorified, after he was risen, did they realize that these things had been written about him and that these things had been done to him. 
these things actually happened. These things that were prophesied had come true. We carry on in verse 28 of, of, of our scripture reading. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he was going further. But they urged him strongly, stay with us. It is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and began to give it to them. Doesn't that sound a bit like deja vu? <laughs> Didn't this happen about a week earlier? The story of the Last Supper, before Jesus is led off to be crucified, he gathers with his disciples and he shares a meal. He takes bread, breaks it, <laughs> I give thanks, breaks it and shares it. And he says, this is my body broken for you. So perhaps the Last Supper wasn't actually the Last Supper, but perhaps it was the first supper. Perhaps it was the beginning of something. Or in fact, to be theologically correct, it wasn't just a first supper, it was actually just another supper. Because this story, God's unfolding folding story of love and of grace and redemption was not something new. And Jesus is saying this is still happening. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. They recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. And, and I think often for us as Christians, encounters with God is, are a bit like that, right? We, we encounter him, we have this real experience, and then it's gone. And we're left thinking, what do we do with this experience? God is with us always, we know this. But, but there are moments when he seems to draw particularly cr- close And if you read in Scripture, you'll find many examples of of God coming close to somebody and then being gone. Or or somebody seeing the back of God just as he was passing by. But these moments are meant to leave us changed. It's an encounter with the risen Christ. Recognizing, Recognizing Jesus was in a sense that moment when, when the disciples moved from ignorance to knowledge it was a moment when they went from not understanding to getting it. Uh, I used to have a science teacher who, who used to tell us, she was a fantastic science teacher. Um, she took me from failing to a very good mark, which I won't brag about. But, but she was a phenomenal teacher. But she used to tell us that she teaches, and a lot of the teachers will relate to this, she teaches for one thing, the aha moment. <laughs> You know that moment? You're busy teaching, you're explaining to the student, and their eyes are kind of glazing over, and they're blank, and they're just not getting it, not getting it, not getting it, and then suddenly it clicks. And they're like, oh, or aha. And suddenly color fills their face, and they're excited, and they realize they're getting it, and they're understanding it, it makes sense. This was a little bit like the moment for the disciples. Suddenly they got it. They saw Jesus, he was gone, but, but they got it. They got it. Or perhaps it's a little bit like, you know, when you hear gossip and you hear only part of the story. (laughs) So somebody comes and tells you, you will not believe what she did. Can you believe it? Can you believe how terrible, how arrogant, how whatever, insert your own words? And you're like, yeah, that's terrible, that's terrible. And then you hear the other person's side of the story. And you're like, oh, (laughs) suddenly I can recognize what is going on here. Maybe there's that third side that's the truth. I know we we talk about that. But the concept that you were missing a piece of key information. You knew everything about Jesus. You had been with him. You had experienced him. You had seen him do miracles. But you had completely missed what he was all about. But now that he did not just die, but that he has risen, suddenly something makes sense. And so they ask each other in verse 32, were not our hearts burning within us when he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us. Were not our hearts burning? They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. 
There they found the 11, the, the, the disciples, and those with them assembled together. And those 11 and those with them were saying, those people were saying, it is true, the Lord has risen. He appeared to Simon, Simon being Peter, sometimes referred to him as Peter. It's true, they, somebody, Simon has just had the same experience, has seen the risen Christ. And so the two then told what had happened on the way, that, on, on their journey, and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke bread. Friends, perhaps you understand why Jesus had to die for you. But do you understand why he had to rise for you? Perhaps you understand why Jesus had to die for you. But do you understand why he had to rise for you? You see, in dying, we experience this understanding of forgiveness, this reconciliation to God. We are no longer separated from God. We do not need to feel that we, we are separate from God. We can be in relationship with him. But rising, when Jesus rises, he calls us to move past that separation, to live, to live a new life. To put it like uh, the self-help gurus like to do, it's a bit of a cliche now, but, but to live your best life. Jesus rising calls us to live in partnership with God. There's a great song that, that we used to sing at my old church. It's, it's, it's one of the, the Hillsong songs. Um, and and in, in the chorus it says, I, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, Lord. Your power, your love, it saved my soul. And then here's the crux. Now I'm alive in you. I live in the risen sun. I live in the risen sun. I'm not just forgiven. I'm not just, wow, thank you, God. Okay, I know my place now. You've forgiven me. Everything's gonna be okay. I'll go to heaven one day. I live in the risen sun. We are called to live in God's story. And this is not a new story. This is God's unfolding story since the beginning of time, where all that he created was good, but over time, things like war, things like famine, things like hunger, things like violence, things like abuse started to happen. God, Jesus, us, are all part of God's unfolding story where he is trying to draw all of creation back to himself, to reconcile what has perhaps gone awry back to himself. And the call of the resurrected Christ is to be a part of that. And this is a good moment to, to punt manna and mercy again, because that's what manna and mercy is all about. If you want to do that course, you're going to discover this big picture purpose of God's plan for the universe. So friends, always forward, never back. That's not really a Christian mantra. I was so glad that when I asked you if you'd heard that, some of you were shaking your head. <laughs> That's not a Christian mantra. I think it would be better to say, understand your past, but live in your present. Understand your past, understand how God has been working with you, has been in your life, has journeyed with you, has guided you, has forgiven you, has, has given you hope in the future, but live in the present. Lent provided us an opportunity to reflect on our salvation, provided us an opportunity to understand God's work in our life. Uh, for, for those of you good Methodists who know about the three graces, uh, Lent is about provenient grace, remembering how God was always with us, even before we knew him, he, he, his, his grace was already active and working in our lives. And then we have this moment of, of justifying grace where we come to discover that we are forgiven, that we can be justified, we can be in relationship with God. That's, that's kind of where Lent ends. But in Methodist tradition, we say there's a third grace, this one of sanctifying grace. Resurrection 
is the call to that big word sanctification, which basically means transform your life. Live it out. Be transformed by God, by the risen Jesus. Bring Christ's hope to the world. Be a part of God's story. During the, Lent, the, the period of Lent in the church, we, we spoke about making a difference. And perhaps that was a good series for you. Perhaps it was challenging. Perhaps you haven't done anything about it. The risen Christ calls us to go and be God's hands and feet in the world, to be a part of his plan, to reconcile all of creation back to himself. Let us pray. Father God, we, we want to live in your resurrection. We want to be people who, who remember how you've been active in our past, who celebrate that, and who understand that you call us to a better way of life a way of life that, that sees the need in this world and responds, that acts out of love, not hate, that brings peace, not war, that brings food, not hunger, that brings water, not thirst. We want to be a part of this. And for each one of us, it will mean something different. But the one thing that is common for all of us, Lord, is we want to live with you. May we as a church, Lord, be a church that truly is a, is, is, is a living, breathing representation of the fact that you are alive and you are active in this world. And may we be a part of helping you to reconcile all of creation back to, the, to yourself, to the way it was meant to be. May your kingdom come. May your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We, we're going to finish, we, we're going to sing a song now, which is a celebration of this. And, and I encourage you to get excited. Uh, I'd intended in my message, I actually forgot, but I want to point it out now, to point out the fact that sometimes we misuse the word resurrection. <laughs> we say, you know, on Easter Sunday, we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. You know, the resurrection is all about how Jesus didn't die, he was risen from life. No, 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 no. <laughs> The resurrection, you don't say resurrection, you say resurrection, <laughs> right? <laughs> resurrection is a big deal. You need the arm, that's kind of part of it. <laughs> it's a big deal, it changes everything, it transforms everything. And so as we sing together, I hope that you might sing out loud, that you may celebrate resurrection, that we may be a church that is alive and is part of God's world. Let's sing together. <laughs>